Peanut Tillman, and this is the NFL Player Second Acts Podcast. I got my guy Roman Harper with me. We're in Phoenix, Arizona at the NFL annual meetings. It's a great time. We got some golf in. It's got some good weather. I, the weather's great. I hit the ball great in golf. I'm looking forward to winning more, even more, even more. And so what we got now is I want to take make sure we tell all of our followers to give us a, a follow, a like, a review, a comment, anywhere you listen to your podcast, whether it's Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio Podcasts, you tell a friend to make sure to tell a friend to tell a friend to check us out. We actually got another follower at breakfast this morning. So just know we continue to spread the word and we're doing our thing. Peanut, who we got today? We got uh, Vikings head coach Kevin O'Connell and Bears GM Ryan Pulse. Check out their interview. Today's guest went 13-4 and four in his first season as a head coach. He won Super Bowl 56 as an offensive coordinator for the Rams. He is a San Diego State alum. He got his first coaching gig in the NFL in 2015. Please welcome our guest, head coach of the Minnesota Vikings, Kevin O'Connell. So uh, you were at the game last night, right? San Diego State. Y'all yep, had a huge, State, huge win. Alabama. Wait, wait, what team did y'all beat? Uh, Alabama. Yeah. He went to Alabama, and I love <laughs> I'll it. I'll tell you what. Oh, my God. I've never seen, I mean, just the, the athletes on that court. San Diego State has done an unbelievable job with their program, but Alabama, my goodness. <laughs> I mean, they're number one overall seed for a reason in yeah, the tournament. Yeah. They, they, uh, we had to, we had to sl- slop it up a little bit, make yeah. a little bit of a street fight to get that one. That's kind of the way we play. But, but it lets you – to me, though, it doesn't really matter about what seed you are because they y'all got the job done. Right. Well, you can. It was it was the first time in a while for me being at an NCAA mm-hmm. tournament game. Um, I'm sure you guys have been to those games before. Yeah, I have. It doesn't feel like it. Just feels like they're regardless of seeds. It feels like there's two teams just playing. Right. And anything can happen. Like yeah. when you're there, you actually feel how a 16 could beat a Purdue. A, you know, FDU could beat Purdue. Yeah. You could. You feel it because that yeah. ball goes up. Momentum swings, and, and that's so big in of, basketball too. You know, it's momentum. It's crazy. All right, it's the same you, in football. You know, yeah. Who's on the 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 you know it's a streak going on? Who goes hot and win? And so lucky for me, I didn't get to watch the game. I was flying here last <laughs> night, so I didn't watch the game. Yeah. I did keep up with the scores, and so San Diego State was up, but it was one half. I'm like, if Alabama shoots well, they beat anybody in the country. Yeah. Clearly, they didn't shoot well. San Diego State, and after talking to some of my friends. It wasn't about what Alabama didn't do, but it was more about what yeah. San Diego State did to Alabama last night. They had a block party, playing great defense. Can you just give me a little insight of what you saw as a basketball matchups? Because I yeah, know you're a big sports guy. Well, shoot, they had to be physical because, I mean, you look at these guys. I mean, Alabama has, first of all, they're big, they're long, they're athletic. I mean, my man, uh, you know, some of these guys, I just watching them in warm-ups, you're looking at one side of the court, it was the old, like, I know you guys did this in your playing career. Sometimes you're playing against a team. You look across the 50 and you're like, my goodness. No, oh, yeah. We'll take that guy, that guy, that guy. We'll take them all. Um, I'm standing there with my son. I brought my eight-year-old Caden and we're watching San Diego State warm up on one side and we're watching Alabama. Alabama looks totally better. And you're like, I, I, I'm having a tough time seeing it. And then that game got started and it literally turned into, I mean, it was nasty, kind of physical. Ball. Yeah. A lot of guys on the ground big diving for loose balls and – um, and Alabama, I just thought it was a great game. San Diego State's up at the half, then Alabama goes up nine kind of early on in the second half. And you could just see the skill. I mean, guys yeah. above the rim, long threes, quickness, speed, all the things that made them the best team in the country. Um, but then San Diego State just, it was like they decided. Right yeah. about the time they got, uh, their bench actually got a tee. Mm. Uh, they got teed up. I don't know who said what. Um, but right about that time, I don't know if it was the head coach or who it was that got it. Uh, they kind of clicked into gear, and every loose ball became theirs. Every long rebound became theirs. Extra possessions, and um, before you know it, that one seed started to press a little bit towards the end, and um, huge win for the program. So basically, sure. Alabama cave on a pressure, y'all, y'all <laughs> cave, right? That sounds about. That sounds about. Right. They're young, though. I, I was. But, I basically stayed at the Alabama team hotel uh-huh. and talking to. They're like, we're really good, but we're young. They're very. And they young. don't know how they're going to respond, and. San Diego State's got a bunch of grown, grown men yeah, on their 22, team. Yeah, 22, 23-year-old guys. It's totally and I think different. that matters. It does I think matter it matters. In time. 
Yeah, well, I'm glad y'all lost. I'm glad your team won. Thank it you. Was, um, it's bad because, you know, Peanut and I got a workout in this morning. And look, I only packed what I packed. So I wasn't anticipating the Alabama <laughs> loss. So I got my Alabama gear on this morning. Literally got some guy from Gonzaga apologizes for me. <laughs> yeah. Had some random guy come up to me. Oh, man, I'm a San Diego State alum. And I'm like, you know, I didn't even ask you. <laughs> come over <laughs> here. You know, just sprinkling <laughs> sprinkling <laughs> salt in the room. I love yeah. you. I loved every minute of it. Everybody I was just, just like, keeps asking me about it. I'm just like, you know, I only packed what I packed. Man, I'm sorry. It was, all the time. Not, <laughs> it was, it was great. It was, I, it was great. I loved you. every minute. Congrats. Yeah. Oh, congrats. congrats. That's I, will, I will say this much. Uh, the Alabama fans, they were awesome. Like during the game, the atmosphere was great. But even after talking to some of them, you know, they were, hey, credits to, credit to where it's due. Yeah. San Diego mm-hmm. State won that game, how they played. You know, we got a – but the the positivity towards that young team, man, I know some of those guys are going to probably be playing in the NBA, but – Shoot, they got a heck of a program. We were so proud of them this year. And uh, I know we're supposed to be talking football, but it's on basketball right now. We were so proud <laughs> of them. Good. Yeah. And it was good. Uh, it was really good. And also, Alabama fans, they love on the basketball team as much as they can. If that would have been a loss on the football oh, side, no. it's totally different emotions. <laughs> yeah. Just know that. It would not have been all nice and everybody, you know, they would, they would not have handled no. that as well. No. Either would Coach Saban, <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. So I've had the I've had the pleasure of uh, going to two Super Bowls. Yep. I've lost two Super Bowls thanks to Peyton Manning. Uh, you won one, you lost one, but we've had the joy of going. I know you won Super Bowl Fifty Six. I, I hate Roman numerals. My Roman numerals off, yeah. but Super Bowl Fifty Six with yep. the Rams. Yep. And three days after winning the Super Bowl, you get hired by the Vikings. Yeah. Do you feel like you had enough time to like really enjoy no. that championship? No, and and the crazy thing is, you know, I can remember it, you know, I officially became the head coach that Wednesday right. following the game, but I mean, I was trying to put together staff right. and even through the interview process. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I didn't want to ever leave anything for my current job mm-hmm. that would have uh, left me thinking, what if, what if I would have done a better job with yeah. the third down pass game plan mm-hmm. or red zone or whatever it was. So I was all in. Um, but then I'd go home at night, 11 o'clock at night, and I'd stay up four or five hours putting together staff, Zoom calls with potential coaches, um, just trying to make sure that, you know, the Vikings weren't in the playoffs last year. So they're not waiting to, right. you know, that's great that you're coaching in the Super Bowl, but you got some responsibilities already. Um, so it was a lot, but I just remember when I, I told myself I got to, you guys remember Super Bowl week. It's oh, kind of, yes. yeah. you know, and we were home Busy. in LA. We didn't even go to the team hotel till Friday or Saturday, whatever it was. So I just said about Wednesday of that Super Bowl game week, I was going to put it all away. And about Wednesday, about one o'clock, I was still doing, so, you know, it was <laughs> the phone would ring and, and there was never totally kind of brushing it to the side, but, uh, I was able to focus on it. Unbelievable experience. To win that game but yeah i was i literally took my son and daughter uh my oldest two to the parade mm-hmm. and uh then met my wife and the rest of my family uh, literally an hour from i left the parade about an hour into it and went to go get on the plane and flew to flew to minnesota and hadn't been back since to california since you know basically that day so it was uh it was fast man it was uh it was it was uh it was not your normal uh, let's just put it this way other people were enjoying that parade right. a little bit more than I was. Yeah, so got, I, I was going to say because you know a lot of times you know after games you win. Okay, we got twenty four hours. Yeah, it. no. Did you even have? I not, did go to the party. Super Bowl, right? I did yeah. go to the Super Bowl party. Got to spend a lot of time. But I mean, before you, know, it was just. It, I'll never forget. I stayed out. Obviously, you play that game. You go yeah. to the party. Mister Cronky put the, put on an unbelievable Super Bowl party. Stayed out late. I just remember my phone going off about 6.30 or 7 o'clock the next morning, and I might have went to bed two hours before that. <laughs> and it was people in Minnesota like, hey, yeah. we need you to dis- – hey, we're trying to get this done or this coaching contract done. Or, Are you good with this? And I was like – and it hit me in that moment. I'm like, this is – nobody cares. Nobody cares. Nobody that, cares, that, yeah. That, so, yeah. I, I got a – I saw I listened to another interview you did, and you talked about – you know, managing your time. Yeah. And so I'm not great at that. So uh, I'm working you, on it myself. Okay. Man. And you said as a head coach, you always feels like, man, it's always something to do. Yeah. Somebody's always depending on you, whether it's, you know, 
it's through the organization, it's charitable causes, it's, you know, lean, you know doing something for a player or your coach is making sure the coordinators, everybody's has something going on. Yeah. So, and versus a coordinator, maybe you had a little bit more waiting time for somebody else to tell you or assistant yeah. to tell you where you need to be going or something to be doing. So how do you manage that? How do you get to this point? Or are you still in this learning process? Or maybe just give us some insight on the difference of being from a coordinator time example to now the head coach and now running the whole thing. Yeah, I think the unique thing for me is trying to be the play caller too right? Uh, on offense. So really, although I've got some great coaches, I got a great offensive coordinator in Wes Phillips. Um, as the play caller, you're still, I feel an obligation to get in front of the unit. I say, oh, yeah. I, I need to be with Kirk in, in, in the quarterback room. I can't just be the voice that shows up. Mm-hmm. on game day and be in his ear and be calling plays. So you've got to tr- totally submerge yourself in in the in the offense with those players, installs in the pass game, run mm-hmm. game, you know, how we're going to play the game, articulating what it's going to take to win the game, um, all those things you do as a coordinator. But I just tried to do a lot of those things on a whole scale with our entire team. Um, you know, I learned from some really good coaches, the previous team I was with and in, in, with the Rams – um, being around Sean and 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 really the coolest thing he did for me was said, hey, you're going to be a head coach. Why don't you just kind of tag along on a lot of this stuff? So oh, I awesome. watched him go yeah, through a lot of that him. process. Kind of like an internship. It's really what of. it felt like yeah. at times. And, and you know, even times where I shouldn't even have been in his office. Uh, hey, why don't you come in? We'll talk about, you know, the OTA schedule or something crazy. Yeah. And you're like, man, this guy truly is pouring into me to develop me to to become a head coach in this league. So um, you know, too much is given, much is required. So I tried to soak it all in. Um, he's one of my closest friends. But what what that really let me see is he's a play caller. Right. That tries to be totally all in on his team. Culture matters, all those things. You can say a lot of things. Yeah. But then you got to back it up. And, and the ultimate enemy to all that is time mm-hmm. um, when you're trying to do everything. Um, I also have, you know, we had our fourth child in during the season, about week eight on a Friday. <laughs> What the heck? Let's just go play the Commanders in Washington. And, and I left my wife at the hospital, and luckily her mom was in town. You know, she had had the baby. Baby was healthy. Wife was healthy. Good. Um, and I went back and went to walk through, then got on the plane and flew to Washington. So, but isn't it crazy that we do that? Though it's and nobody. <laughs> like, I actually, a lot of people gave me a. You know, I thought people would be like, "Man, that what a what a coach going to." But I took some pretty good, you know, pushback from like our our female fan base of mm-hmm. hey. You don't know what it's like to have a child. You're there supporting, <laughs> you know, basically being a cheerleader for it. But, you know, we're the ones that I can't believe you left her at the hospital. Uh, I, I, there were some people that genuinely were not happy that I left. I got and, the the flip side of it, though, because we had played a game. Well, my wife was she was pregnant and someone asked the question, um, what uh, if, if she goes in labor, you know, are you going to go? And I was like, well, yeah, I'll just miss the game. And then everyone was like, oh, oh, why would you do that? Do you only get paid for 16 games? You only work 16 days a year and yeah. all this other stuff. Like, So it's kind of like damned if you do, damned if you don't. Oh, and no doubt. It's, it, yeah, was, no doubt. it was one of those questions. I was just like, eh, whatever. I'm well, I, about it. well I, I missed my first child's birth because she came on a playoff game and you know, I, I was in San Francisco. She yeah. wasn't supposed to go. She was late. Yeah. Then next, you know, I get a call, miss like six phone calls and you look up, you're like, Oh, she's going to labor. She's like, I'm going to hold it. I'm like, okay, babe, I appreciate that. <laughs> appreciate that. And then it's like, nah, second quarter is all good. But when, did I, you, when did you first get the first text you actually saw? Was it before the it, game? No, it was after the game. It was after. It was so after. You didn't and we, know. No, I had no idea. What would you have done if you if you had got that? Like, you come in <laughs> pregame, the last 20 minutes you come in from that, what would you have done? I would probably would have been emotional and like I probably been a little shook. You know, you want to yeah. be angry, you want to be in this zone. Yeah. And all of a sudden you get like the picture of your first child. <laughs> it's just like it's gotta it's gotta shake That's you a little bit. Yeah. This, there's no. no way you can't be thinking about that no. and then try and go out there in the before the biggest playoff game of your, you yeah. know, at the time. But it was uh it was fireworks. It was a great game. But talk about a day of emotions, though. Yeah. I mean, you're playing a playoff game, actually, you know, your daughter's born. You lose the playoff game after you put so much into it, a nail biter. And then, you know, everybody else is sad. And then you're kind of happy. I um, remember that game. Yeah. It, and, uh, was that it, against us? No, that was San against Fran, the, uh, right? San Francisco. Alex kind of ran yeah, that ball yeah. down. We ran the, the quarterback side, sweep. Yep. We blitzed from the, his right side the whole yep. game. And all of a sudden they ran quarterback sweep away. Yeah. You are. You, that, that's part of your inventory, right? Oh, that's, yeah. That's what you call former film. Well, I'll, I'll, I can remember some of the plays <laughs> in that game. It was like, who they have? Crabtree. And, yes. Oh, Crabtree. Yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah, uh, yeah. 
the the tight end um Vernon Davis yeah, caught Vernon. the game winner. That's right. And so uh it was a it was a great game. I mean, we had five turnovers. Was that when they had uh Tony Montana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was it. Yeah, that was yeah, the Tony yeah. Montana yeah. game where they they played uh, Future was yeah, on Future the, on the, in the was dugout. On the dugout. Yeah. Yeah. Old yeah. Candlestick. It was uh, yeah. it was Old rocking. Candlestick. It was a <laughs> great atmosphere. It was electric. I'm telling you. And that's saying something because you played in one of the best for a long time. <laughs> Thank you. At the Superdome, man. Yeah, sure. that was one of the best atmospheres I've ever been a part of. So, um, who would was, you say? So you you're talking about uh, Sean's one of your one of your closest friends, yeah. and I know 2008 you got drafted yep. by the Patriots. Josh McDaniels, he was uh, the OC yep. at the time. Who would you say you're? And I'm sure you learned a, a lot from him, just kind of you Tom. know him and Tom and all that. Yeah. Who would you say you're? Um, I, I think a lot of coaches they they, they talk about tree. being a coaching tree. Yeah. Like who would you say you're a disciple of, or who's a part of? Like just what tree did so you come much, from? Honestly, so much of what we do offensively and everything was kind of shaped in in in, in LA mm-hmm. and, and what we tried to do. So the first name is always Sean McVay just because he did so much for me as a coach. Yeah. And it was really cool because I I had been friends with Sean um for about my entire coaching career since about 2015. Mm-hmm. Um, but really kind of he gets the head job in LA. I go to he's a, instrumental in me getting the quarterback job in Washington as he's kind of leaving town. Um and I just never forget it being like he he told me at the time, he's like, we'll circle back and, and I'm going to get a chance to hire you. And then three years later, he's bringing me out there to be the coordinator, um, you know, a huge moment in my career. And then also ultimately we, you know, make the trade for Matthew Stafford. We mm-hmm. win a Super Bowl and then I become a head coach. So I, I owe so much to Sean yeah. um, from that standpoint. But you talk about it. I. I, I don't know if you can be a player and then be part of a coaching tree of somebody right. else, but I learned a ton from Coach Belichick. Um, you know, last year I got to sit right next to him at these owners' meetings for three days, and it's like, you know, that's Coach next to me. And I, <laughs> Was uh, that a little weird? I, at first it was, and then he had a real way of kind of breaking the ice in his own yeah. way, so he made it uh, – <laughs> He made it not weird at all, and we actually had some great football discussions, and kind of, and 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 then that carried over to when we played him on Thanksgiving this year, and and spent some time with him after the game. I, I think the world of him, but Josh McDaniels, Billy O'Brien, Bill Belichick. I mean, there's unbelievable coaches that I was, you know, around being around Nick Casario in the mm-hmm. personnel department. Mm-hmm. I just learned so much, and and had no business learning it at the time. I was so far. I mean, talk about being thrown in the deep end of the pool. Uh, but I still look back on some of those notebooks from team meetings or right. some of those offensive installs and just it's like somebody teaching you things that you had no idea right at the time you're writing things down and you're really not absorbing it and then mm-hmm. all of a sudden you get this job and you start being responsible for a whole heck of a lot more than right than really just being a backup quarterback on a team you go back through some of these notes and it's gold right there you know on the pages of that notebook um, so I have to give so much credit. And then everybody in between. I mean, you guys know some of the best moments, some of the best playing j- career moments you had might have been on some of the worst teams you played for. Or, oh, yeah. You know, where you personally, individually might have been at your best. I still tell people some of the best coaching jobs uh, that I've ever done. We might have won four or five games my first mm. year in Cleveland doing it. Right. But, shoot, I, you know, I felt like I'd, you know. I Coach your tail I, off. I coached my tail off. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's what you learn about this is if, if you get uh, – and it, sometimes people could say it's a cliche, but if you get – wrapped up and be in, in being defined by the results of what we do, whether you're a player or coach, uh, you know, it can really hold you back from reaching your true potential. I tend to focus as much as possible on the process of how I do things, why I do things. And then can I make the people around me better at, at, at doing what they love to do and, and just being a, you know, a, a positive part of their day. So when they walk through the, I said it day one, year one in, in Minnesota, and I think we accomplished it. But I wanted our players to walk through the door and feel like, shoot, leaving at the end of the day, this was a positive thing for me today. Mm-hmm. I got better today. Um, I like being around my teammates. I like being a part of this. Um, and I, it was really important for us to do that. And now we got to build on it. I remember Rivera used to always say that. He was like, uh, after practice was over, he would always say, you don't have to rush out of here to go home now. Yeah. Like, you can, you, y'all, y'all can stay because I think he just wanted us to be around each other. Yeah. <laughs> Just be locker room guys. You yeah, know. And, and that that I think it's that that says a lot. It does. And if you like your space, you want to mm-hmm. be there. Yeah. And you care about the people around you. And I, I think last year was such a great example of you guys really hitting it running. Yeah. And could you talk about maybe the success that you guys had last year? Maybe what some of the things that you saw early that you knew these guys were going to be successful. And then also where does this team and organization 
What does it look like going forward? Yeah, I think one of the cool things for us was I I just remember coming in and guys like Eric Kendricks, Harrison Smith, um, Dalvin Cook, uh, guys that have been staples, Adam Thielen of yep. the Minnesota Vikings mm-hmm. organization and have played a lot of football, won Especially a lot of Harrison games. Smith. He's Her- been I there. mean, Harrison's – is he your 12, 13? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, and l- we're lucky enough to be able to bring him back, which mm-hmm. was huge for me to, to be able to keep him, um, you know, on our team and as part of our leadership with that C on his chest. But I knew we had a good makeup of great leaders that have mm-hmm. been around, you know, a, a certain way of doing things for a long time. We were going to come in and, and right, wrong, or indifferent, we were going to just be different. And uh, I, I told our team this. I believe so much in, in the why behind how we're going to do things. Uh, because I just got done winning a Super Bowl, doing mm-hmm. it that way, and feeling a certain kind of way every day, and feeling the joy of even in our league when the the circumstances and the stress can uh, sometimes overtake organizations and and be their demise. In LA, we just found a way to enjoy, even when we dealt with adversity. It mm-hmm. wasn't all just smiles and candy canes, and, mm-hmm. and and it it was it was real, tangible human being interaction, dealing with adversity and overcoming. Went in a super, you know, all of those things to reach the pinnacle of our profession together. Uh, so nobody can tell me nothing about there's another way to do it because this is the way I know. Yeah. And I think you guys are going to enjoy this. And I think you guys are going to want to do it this way. And we'll worry about the results when they come. And, you know, I, I think in those close games, those end of game moments, we relied on that stuff. So anybody that says it's just kind of cliche coach speak stuff. Uh, when stuff got really hard, we the best version of our team came out. They did. And I think that that. You know, we weren't always perfect. There's a thousand things that I need to do better and, and that I'm working on to try to be better for our organization. But uh, we relied on that. And uh, it was really cool to kind of see how it happened in year one and just kind of moving forward. It's easy to do in year one, right? It's easy to come in and be different and kind of sell something off a win in a Super Bowl. And, hey, we win 13 games. And this is why I got all the answers. Well, now you got to go, you know, not only duplicate that in year right. two. Uh, but now you're playing a first place schedule. Now you're playing, now you're kind of, you're not sneaking up on anybody anymore. And, uh, you know, we're going to have to be at our best and be more consistent with how we do it, play a better brand of football, rely on all those things and and improve from a standpoint of our technique fundamentals. And then make sure we understand the culture thing doesn't just, just because you achieved it in year one, it's a daily thing. Culture is people, culture is interaction, culture is, uh, never missing a you know a moment to say hey great job hey mm-hmm. you know we got to get better here that accountability thing <clears throat> um, a new thing for me is that personal responsibility like I think accountability is you guys feeling like I need to be accountable to you but how about me being accountable to myself mm-hmm. that's that personal responsibility that I think is going to be huge for our team and the growth of the next generation of Minnesota Vikings leadership right. we got some of the best players at their position in football Justin Jefferson. Christian Darisaw, Brian O'Neill. I mean, we've got TJ Hawkinson. We've got some unbelievably young, talented players with so much potential right. to be great in our league. But I want them to understand it's time for them to wear the C on their chest. Mm. It's time for them to take the next step and and help be a, a main reason why we sustain the great culture that so many great Vikings helped us build in year one. Yeah. So the the name of this podcast is the NFL Player Second Acts Podcast. So yeah. we played, we retired. We did something else in our in our second act. You played, retired. You got into broadcasting. Yeah, did that for a brief stint. Yeah, and I'm sure you enjoyed it. I what did. made you What made you want to get out of the broadcasting and, and get back into coaching? Well, I had just finished up. I was doing some kind of combine training on the side. You know, the quarterback guru <laughs> circuit, <laughs> thinking you got all the answers. <laughs> There's no scoreboard in that game, so that's. <laughs> That's one of the all you need that, is one to hit though. That, yeah, right. I, mean, look, I watched Jordan Palmer over this last Jordan's week. Jordan's awesome, man. but he's, he's great. A good for I mean, line. once he hit Josh Allen, he's like, bro, I got it. I got <laughs> yeah. the book. I tell, like, I tell him all the time. I'm the cheat code. Go <laughs> through me. Like, I tell him. I can all give time, you the man. next Josh Allen. <laughs> it is so convenient to <laughs> to be able to put the, and he's really good at what he does. But <laughs> it is so convenient to look up at that scoreboard at whatever field that they're playing at. And that thing is off. <laughs> there, there's no, there's no running tally. Point. There's no, you know, two unbelievable defensive players that are tasked with taking away. You know, it's just about footwork. It's about throwing yeah. a pretty spiral. Look at this cool drill you can come yeah. up with. That is, I've been down that Setting road. Setting up and a it good is a pro fun, day with the is, throws, it, right? Oh man, building each one off no. of it. It's it like, is, <laughs> I give, I give guys a hard time because I, I'm jealous of those guys right, because right, right. in March and April. 
they're at some field for two hours and then they, they're home with their kids and on the beach and doing all the things that they shoot. They might even be having the workout on the beach right, for all I right. know. Uh, but I did that. Uh, I did some college football broadcasting. Loved it. I actually really did. I, mm -hmm. I loved being able to do production meetings and meet coaches and, and players. Mm -hmm. I, I did some games up at Army. Um, you know, I did six games up there and meeting some of the cadets and just totally different type of human being than than what I felt like I deserved to be spending a lot of time right. with these guys were unbelievable. Um, but then Mike Petton called and he said, you know, I, they, you know, Mike had tried to get me to come work for him before. Rex Ryan had tried to get me to come work for him before. It just never felt right. I felt like I had kind of owed it to my wife to let her have a life. And, yeah. you know, we had moved around so much with me as a player that I wanted her to have a home base. Uh, but then Mike Petton called and offered me the quarterback coaching job. And that was – not something that I felt entitled to by any stretch, but um, just felt like it was an unbelievable opportunity, and I was ready to. At that point, the timing worked out, and I've uh, been doing this ever and since. And how long man. before? How long did you do broadcasting? Two years. Two years. So I got then. done playing in 2012, kind of 13, 14. I did the broadcasting stuff, and then and quarterbacking. Uh, you know the quarterback too. Yeah. So when you be guru, just... man, it's on my it's on my business card. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, and then 15 started coaching. And I had done, I did a training camp internship, got a chance to be around Kyle Shanahan in yeah. 2014, was awesome. Um, so I was, I made sure, I made sure I stayed around it and 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 really watched a bunch of tape. Tried to, that, that's really where I like doing the draft stuff is the on the grass stuff was fun, but I got to spend, you know, time with Marcus Mariota, Jameis Winston, you know, Johnny Manziel coming out that, yeah. that year. Um, just doing ball in a, in a quarterback, almost like a quarterback meeting room, watching mm -hmm. tape and, uh, you know, just trying to teach and, and, and learn myself, you know, and how you to always say learning the why, yeah. why are you making these decisions? Why exactly. are you doing this? And when why? you ask that question, it is amazing the types of things you'll hear people say, cause it's never, ever what you think. So, they interpret it or they read it completely differently. Exactly. Right. I just like that with my kids, like, why would you do that? And then they give you some crazy answers. Like. I never thought that. I, okay. I guess it makes sense to you in your little 10 year old mind. Yeah. But yeah. There's, but there's so much that a 10 year old mind to a, you know, a, a franchise 50, quarterback 50, 50 in the end. Mind, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you, the why matters. Yeah. And, and most definitely. I've just learned if you coach it and mm -hmm. you believe it and you give these players the why, mm -hmm. they're so smart and they're so committed to being great at what they do. I mean, you guys are two great examples of it. Uh, you guys were, you mentioned Ron Rivera already. I'm sure you guys could say coach after coach. That oh, yeah. When you close your eyes, you think back to that DB meeting when they told you why you were going to play this trap coverage a certain yep. way or why you had to, you know, punch at the ball the way you did. I'm sure that was natural in a lot of ways, <laughs> but somebody, somebody told you why to, you know, why and how to do it at some oh, point. At, and then you took it because you're a great player and make it your own. When I tell Justin Jefferson, this is how I want you to run this route because this and this reason – and this is why it's important. And then he goes and makes it his own at a world-class level. That, to me, is coaching in our league. Yeah. Coaching is not waving your finger at somebody telling them rules and this is why you can't do things and this is why my way is the, the only way. No, it's a, a truly a collaboration with world-class athletes and guys that just want to be pointed in the right direction, tell them where to go, and, and I promise you they're going to do everything they can to go get it done. Now, you may have just answered this question. Like literally with that answer that you just gave, <laughs> that was beautiful because a lot of people don't understand that. Yeah. The understanding that what coaches see that really lights them up or gives them joy. Yeah. And you kind of just said that what gives you joy when you see these things in your special athletes. But what I want to know, though, is that so many people talk about how smart you are, your IQ, your game prep, the, all the things that you do before the game that leads up to this game. Yeah. And so could you give us an example of something that, man, this was something that I had dialed in and it showed up in the game and it was beautiful. Like, just give us that aha moment at any point in time last year that you saw that kind of comes to mind. I see it in your eyes. Well, I, only because I was just thinking about it off of that previous kind of talking about Justin Jefferson. And there was an example, um, you know, we were playing the Patriots on a short week, Thursday mm -hmm. night, Thanksgiving. And, uh, you know, people had started for the really for the first time in his career doubling him. I mean, you guys played against right, players right, where right. it was, hey, cover one, double 18, wherever mm -hmm. he is. So um, we were playing the Patriots. I know the background of the that defensive, that defensive. philosophy yep. and, and Coach Belichick. I could literally envision him standing up in front of the team saying, we may lose the game 
a couple ways, but I can tell you how it's not going to happen. We're not going to let 18 beat us. Yep. Uh, so I, I vividly remember telling Justin in a, in a pass install, hey, they're going to double team you, but I think it's going to come – uh, if we put you in the slot, I think it's going to come from the nickel outside leverage and the safety being inside leverage from depth. I call it an east-west double. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it doesn't always have to be side by side. But I told Justin, I said, if you can just vertically beat the nickel and then put your foot in the ground and vertically, you kind of treat it as a two-part two process. You're just running an inside fade. Mm -hmm. But beat the nickel with your release get up on the toes of the safety and then stick him. Mm -hmm. um, I promise you, double team or not, you're going to catch you. You're going to go get this ball. The splitter. And, and I got Kirk Cousins looking at me like, he's going to be double and you want him to just run a fade, a go ball? <laughs> and I was like, yes, I know you guys think I'm crazy. but And then it, and then I kind of saw how they were playing early on in the, court, in the first quarter. And I went over and I told him, I said, I'm calling this play. Don't think I'm crazy. You're gonna. It's gonna hit. It's gonna hit. And it literally, like, like it was almost <laughs> like it fell into place in the in that ex, in that exact moment, and it hit. And uh, you know, I'm you know, I'm over there. Justin comes running off, and it was like five plays later in the drive, and he comes running off, and I'm like, I told you about that. I told you you were gonna beat that double. And he's like, What are you talking? Are you talking about that play five? I'm like, Oh, it wasn't as big deal to you as it was to me, I guess. But this was, I mean, but that was one of those moments, and I was just thinking about it before you yeah. asked the question. But stuff like that is when it kind of. I think you get a, it buys you some credibility right. with the guys and and shoot they'll tell you for every one time like that there's probably three times where I say some crazy stuff that that doesn't end up panning out or maybe the exact opposite <laughs> thing happens but you get those wins you'll you'll take them every time you can get them and coming from a safety that is literally the worst route to get and try and stop yeah. in a double because yeah. it's the splitter right down the middle oh yeah you uh, got everything safe, inside yeah, downhill, safety's out, yeah. drive on this I'm but high also, and inside. <laughs> Corners, their nickels, you need to blow it outside, and next exactly. you know, I'm sitting waiting on him to stop, and he just runs slapped by everybody. And it's yeah. like it's the one that nobody ever talks yeah. about, but it's the one the easiest double team beat. Yeah, I love it. No, it's awesome. So, thirteen and four, rookie season, yeah. right? You tied with two other coaches in their rookie season, going thirteen and four. Do you know who those rookie coaches are, off the top of your head? Either, I'll give you one clue. One is coaching now. One is still coaching now. Is it Matt? He's one. LaFleur? Yeah, I knew Matt. And then the other one's got to be. So this other coach is still coaching, but in college. That, yeah. That's the only clue I'll give you. Really? Was he in? Goofy, you got the answer on your sheet. Why are you looking at me like that? Because I'm, I'm playing it up for the camera. Okay. <laughs> It's we gotta be Jim Harbaugh, then, right? <laughs> oh yeah, there you it's go. gotta be. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. I was thinking Sam Fran mm -hmm. was uh, was at that time. Because I know there's a, there were there were some other I, the RPR guys had had given me a list at one point this year, um, and I remember seeing a lot of the folks that had done it. You know, they also had something else yeah. in common. I, they had pretty good quarterbacks, just like yeah, I got that to does have help. too. In Kirk, I, I know Steve Young might have been somebody's quarterback at one point, or. You know, but but as far as those guys, Aaron Rodgers, and then I think, uh, you know, Jim had uh, Alex Smith, who's I got to coach in Washington, yeah. somebody that I uh, absolutely love, love, love Alex Smith. So big time. So having the privilege and honor to coach, or excuse me, to shadow uh, Sean, yeah, uh, being in all those meetings and and him kind of mentoring you along the way and trying to prepare you to become a head coach. Was there was there one thing that happened? this past season that you weren't prepared for or didn't expect or just kind of shocked you? That's a good question. Uh, that is a good question. Um, I would probably say there were some real personal moments for okay. some players. Uh, we had a player mm -hmm. lose a, lose his dad mm -hmm. in training camp. We had a coach lose his dad in training camp. Um, there was just some moments throughout the year, uh, either with players having, you know, you know, having their, their girlfriends or wives have babies and, you know, the, the just these young players, just those were the things that, yeah, because um, you get so wrapped up in in just our game, and sometimes it can feel like the most important thing in the world. Mm -hmm. Nothing else matters, and then there's like a real life moment that happens, mm -hmm. and you're just nothing. You're just nothing more than a support system. You're just, right. you know, hey, football doesn't matter. You know, come talk to me about, you know, open up and talk to me like like you would a brother or a 
uncle or a father or whatever, because some of these guys, if you're not going to do that for them, who, who will? will? Yeah. And and I just found like those moments kind of, you, you, you hate to say that you needed some of those moments to truly grasp the, the importance of your role outside of just winning and losing. Um, but those would probably be, I mean, some of the football things that came up, learning moments for me, but those would, those are the moments I can remember vividly how I felt, you know, both during and then after, and then the response from the player or coach, you know, where there's nobody else. You're the head coach, you know, yep. they're looking for guidance and support. Right. Um, and are you willing to give it to them in those, in those critical moments? Kevin, do you think being a former player has given you an advantage for being a coach in some shape or form? Like, you know what it's like. Like dealing with the same example yeah. you're talking about, like you've been in that locker room where your guy's hurting yeah. and you don't just look at it as like, it's, I'm just focused on X's and O's. I think it's two things. I think, yes, for, for a standpoint of that, of knowing the, I just remember as a player, there were some days where nobody asked me how I was doing, right? you know, nobody cared how I was. It's a know, great so, point. So there's never a moment where if I'm walking by a player down our beautiful hallways in our buildings, brand new building that we have, whatever it is. I'm never going to not look you in the eye and say, how you doing, man? Yeah. Like, and, and you may not always tell me, hey, coach, it's actually funny ass. I'm not doing well. You may not, but I'm going to ask you enough that if I ask you 10 times and one time I feel like that was different than the other nine times, it's probably not going to be the last time you hear me ask about you. Mm. So it's like, I think that's important. And then the other thing is I do, th I do believe very, very uh, strongly in the sports performance and can we run an organization – uh, from a standpoint of, I believe players are inherently, if you get the right kind of guys, I believe they're tough. Yeah, I believe they're smart. I believe they care about doing what it takes to win. But can we have a team that when that three and a half hour window happens on Sunday, our players are fresher than the other side? Yeah. Can we put together a schedule uh, where we're tactically, mentally prepared to play a game, but we got a little bit more life in us. We got a little bit more juice in us because of how we do things, both mm. in training camp, game week, walkthroughs, how we travel, you know, where we put the players on the plane when we travel, like all that stuff matters. Yeah. Like what we it feed does. them, what we, you know, I, if we're going to cut any corners, it's not going to be something that the players will feel. I can right. promise you that. And and we're lucky. We're lucky to have the support we do from our owners and, and our organization and the great people that are around our players. Um, and I think they felt it. Mm -hmm. So now it's, you know, uh, I think that's important that we not only continue to be one of the, you know, one of the best in the league yet. Yeah. But let's go try to be the best. And I believe you guys were know. voted number one in the first time they had this Yeah, vote. the NFLPA thing, which it's great for me to talk about, oh, yeah, but yeah. for the players to I was applauding. I was going to applaud that's you big, guys. Though. It was yeah. that's huge. So big. The yeah. fact that that was the first time this stat or this, uh, and for those that don't know, they, they had a ranking that said the best player – experience yeah. between each organization ranked upon like food, food facilities, facilities rest, like travel, 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 travel strength, strength, yeah. strength conditioning, yeah. trainers, yeah, all those the things. whole nine and uh the whole gambit of what it really entails. A's across the board. It was. It yeah. was that's impressive on y'all. And that's where it made but, me but, overlook the cold. I was but like, honestly maybe, think back to this maybe. though. Like it's easy for me to sit up here and try to take the credit. But think about like you guys can probably I could say right now uh, you know, who was your favorite equipment guy? Yeah. And you Team remember. <laughs> who was your, you know, you had a trainer that you always went to. No thanks. Yeah, I mean, you had to, <laughs> no your strength doubt. coach that got you. Yeah, Rusty. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, so the fact is it, it kind of came together in a really cool way where I just wanted to empower those people. But mm -hmm. this is the first time. That's why I told D and some of those guys with the NFLPA, I said, I love the fact that you did it. I'm sure some organizations don't. Uh, but I just like the fact that, shoot, I'm giving game balls out. You know, I'm having game balls made for our training staff and our, you mm -hmm. know, the people that coordinate our travel logistics. And, you know, they. You know, it's a lot. It's a lot of work that they don't get credit. So, for. No, so much nobody work. would ever yeah. know. So Correct. now at yeah. least there's Absolutely. a way for people to get credit. And, you know, teams need to improve. Which, there's a which way. team got the worst grade? Oh, we don't have to talk about that. Yeah. Oh, it was the Saints. It was not the same. Oh, the way you said it, I, <laughs> I, 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 I did think that I too. assumed it was the Saints. I was like, well, it had to be the Saints. <laughs> it wasn't. The beautiful thing about it, though, is the team that got the worst grade, I guarantee, hopefully, the ownership is like, look. We got to be better. We got to be You know who was surprisingly at the bottom, at the lower tier, was the Kansas City Chiefs. So teams tell on themselves and I think it will be a challenge going forward for those that are at the bottom to say hey we don't want to be at the bottom because it's always competitive mm -hmm. and so it'll be really interesting to see how this thing continues to progress because this was just year one yeah 
that this this thing came out. So I I, I loved it. I thought it was I highly like it highly too. intriguing. I like it too. Yeah. Well, no, Kevin, that's that's it, man. You, I pre- awesome, pre- man. appreciate you uh, coming on the show. Uh, I got one more question. Rapping. Oh, I because as a coach, I've I've had former players that have gotten into that side of the business that are now coaching. Yeah, and they said it was a little bit tougher for them. Like non-player coaches sometimes look at players' coaches as like former player coaches that these guys come in, they think they know this or oh, that. Yeah. They it, it's a little bit tougher for the former players to all of a sudden kind of get the same credit early as the guys that were not just because maybe it's a different grind. I don't know. Maybe you could speak on that a little bit. If you, you didn't yeah. seem like you've had to go through that as much, but you do understand it. Yeah. I think uh, I tell people a lot of times like that maybe say, Hey, you were never a quality control coach. I would challenge them to go see me years three, four, and five with the New York <laughs> Jets, drawing cards, running the scout team, you know, breaking down tape for Sanchez, like right. writing up the third down. Like I was doing a lot of the jobs that I now ask a assistant quarterback coach to do. Yes. I was doing those things while I was playing. Why? Because I learned very early on, maybe in New England or when I got to New York with Rex, uh, you got to do something to provide value. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's really hard to provide value as a third quarterback. It was so hard that they eventually got rid of it altogether <laughs> with that emergency. Theory. Maybe it's coming back. We're going to talk about that this week. But uh, but I say that, you know, I feel like that's one thing. But really, in, in its purest form, a good coach is a leader, a teacher, mm-hmm. and a motivator. And if you've got if, – if you feel like there's something positive, which I'm sure both of you guys probably do, from your playing career that can help you be a better leader, teacher, and motivator um, – by all means, you're going to be a really good coach. You're going to have to work really hard at right. it because to do it the right way, oh. it takes a lot of time and sacrifice to do it the right way because at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is if you're a position coach, are, is your position group prepared Yeah, as best as they possibly can be to go do their jobs? And are you – I I coached Josh McCown, who was older than me. I coached him my first year coaching. And at the end of the year, I said, Josh, how did you think I did? He's like, you made me a better player. I think you did a great job. And to this very day, I'm still really close with him. And I'll, he just got into he coaching. He just got it. Yeah, he just, just got, got in. Carolina. And I tried to hire him a year ago, and I <laughs> love him to death. But he's going to be a great coach because he literally could sit there and say, you made me a better player. Regardless mm-hmm. of what your, you know, what, how many game balls you got at home or how many years you've been doing it, you have one role. How well can you, uh, you know, execute that role for somebody else first. So that's what coaching is. You're, if you're a servant mindset yeah. to being a coach and, and you have a, a, a background of being able to absorb some information, um, in the end, you still got to, you know, provide the path to guys having success on the grass, but mm-hmm. there's a whole lot that goes into it. Can you teach? Can you lead? Can you motivate? Um, and you're going to be just fine. I like that. Teach, lead, motivate. I love it. You're Man, you might be a coach now, man. I appreciate that. We both would be really good coaches. If you ever want to get into it, man, just you know where to find me. <laughs> we'll do. We'll do. And that top tier facility up in Minnesota That's right. is where I'll know, find right? you. That's right. Kevin, last question before we get you out of here. <laughs> this is a question we ask everybody that comes on our podcast. Yes. Who is on your personal Mount Rushmore? Four people. Like mentor. Oh, someone man. that that yeah. that that has And I know this would be really good for you because you. yeah. It, Poured into you. You've just, already mentioned twelve people. Yeah, no, but you got to pick four. There's only four spots ooh. on this mountain. Well, I think for well, sure. This is life, not just sports. Not yeah, just. Yeah, no, I think uh, you know my grandfather uh, for sure would be on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, my dad would be on there. Tell me why your grandfather. Uh, my grandfather, because he just uh, you know was an unbelievable uh, leader of just human beings Mm -hmm. and was a great just had such a didn't come from a whole lot and just kind of built an incredible life for himself and then uh, I got really close with him my grandma passed away when I was Mm -hmm. in college and he actually would drive around the country to my games in an RV oh that's that's awesome and be at the games and then I actually trained for the draft out here in Arizona this is where he lives and and literally spent I lived with him spent time so we just became really close but he's Mm -hmm. always uh, you know, just been somebody that I've looked up to. Mm. Uh, my dad was the same way. My dad was in the FBI for 25 years, um, worked his absolute tail off. Talk about personal sacrifice right. for, for your family. And so those, those two for sure. And, and they get their own, their own wing of, 
of Mount Rushmore, I guess. But, uh, you know, Sean McVay would be on there just because of his direct impact on mm -hmm. me, um, for sure. Um, and then shoot, man. One more. I would probably say, shoot, I would probably say, I'm going through whether it's a player, coach, I would probably say Bill Belichick just because just I watched just – I don't know if anybody loves football as much as he does mm -hmm. and, and just his impact on a team and just so many different human beings. I don't think I could be a head coach in this league yeah. without having been a player for him, if awesome. that makes any sense. That is so, an ultimate yeah. compliment. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. No, That's, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, His mannerisms, the everything. Just And his ability, like everybody has this perception of him and it's real, but then there's also the time walking down the hallway where he pulls you aside and says, hey, you know, this is what you're doing well. This is what you could do better. And this is how you should do it. Go, go do those things. And, and just his care of every single player on his roster, mm -hmm. how you can help the team win, put the team first, you know, all the things that makes up what they, what, what it means to play for him. The man doesn't miss anything. He, he sees everything. Sees it all. He sees And has all. respect for, you know, just some of the things he, even this year, it kind of cemented that this <laughs> year, text messages I, mm -hmm. I received from him after a big win, we beat Buffalo or, we come back from 33 down against the Colts and win. Like he was always just acknowledging those things as yeah. accomplishments. For That's sure. cool because people have that perception because he's just so – he has that stoic look of just yeah. seriousness all the time. But he's a big teddy bear deep down inside. That's cool. That's real cool. Yeah, for sure. Kevin, man, thank you, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate you guys. Thanks. Thank you. Right there, you just heard Kevin O'Connell, head coach of the Minnesota Vikings, really giving us some insight on his whole career path from playing yeah. to all of a sudden now being the man over one of the the best seasons for a first year coach. I Pina, don't really, I don't really like him, but I like him now though. Like, <laughs> how can you not like him and the success that he's had? Like, I, I'm mad he's in the NFC North, but I'm, I'm, don't hate me for saying this, Bears fans, but I'm, I'm kind of wanting him. To, to succeed a little bit because after that that little interview we had like I, I like the guy I it like seems him. like you're still struggling to say you even like him right I, now I am I don't want to get crucified <laughs> but I, I I like what he's doing in, in Minnesota you know what I'm saying but I here's here's a here's a counter move to that I love what Bears GM Ryan Poles has done this offseason and to hear more about what he's doing now and how he got his role check him out in this interview We got a special guest, this next guy. He's a part of the Bears organization. He spent 13 years with the Kansas City Chiefs in various roles, and now he is currently the Chicago Bears GM. Please welcome to the podcast, Mr. Ryan Poles. Welcome, welcome to the show, brother. Thanks Thank for uh, blessing us with your presence. Now, you have been extremely busy this offseason. Yep. And just the guy, one, being a former player on the on the team and just all the buzz around Chicago and just around the league, uh, everybody is loving what you and the rest of the organization are doing with the pick, trading it, getting rid of it and getting more draft picks, all the signings and stuff. Like the city is on fire right now. The and DJ just, Moore aspect, I, I got to hear it. How'd, yeah. you, how'd you pull that off? That was we like love a little. It. We're loving. That was it. a little caveat that nobody saw. We're loving it, right? Right. How do, yeah. So how how does how does a GM negotiation for another GM? How does like that negotiation go? Yeah, it's just it's conversation like we're having right here. Okay. Um, obviously, you do your homework of of what teams mm -hmm. you know are looking to move up, and you start looking at their roster. You look at you know the picks now and in the future. And you start brainstorming, you put together different sequences that make sense, you know, for the Chicago Bears. You just have to find out if it's it makes sense for them. Right. So you go back and forth and have those conversations that go over a couple of weeks. And there's some non-negotiables that you say, well, I need to have this in the package. OK. And um, and DJ was that for us. OK. Uh, we wanted to add more playmakers uh, to this roster. Uh, we want to player that can really help Justin be mm -hmm. successful. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's kind of what we stuck with and we, we went hard on that and it worked out. I got to know this because, mm -hmm. all right, going through like player contracts, you know, trade 
trade deals. Mm-hmm. I always think it's like it's, it's some kind of sliding slick to the game, right? Because everybody's talking about Lamar Jackson needing an agent to do his deal. Like, yeah. do, do your teams ever lead out with their best deal? Like, what's the negotiation process? Or do, you, do I give you the C deal, then wait on your B deal, then all right, I'll give you, then we work our way up to the A and then we get, they get it all done. Yeah, really for any negotiation that I've been a part of, even from my time in Kansas City to now, you know, both sides start to their most favorable you know, set Okay, okay. And then you you work in from there. Okay. So that's kind of how it goes So down. nobody just gets, shows their hand early, like, okay, this is exactly what I want. Let's just... No. no, no. <laughs> so you must be good at, like, getting cars, right? I'm, I'm sure you... When, you, when, you're trying to go, like, when you're trying to go get a car or yeah. buy a house, you're yeah. just like, look, man, I'm a GM of a billion-dollar corporation. <laughs> I know I can get the best dang deal. Yeah. Like, that's, that's, that's awesome. So you spent 13 years with various titles and roles mm-hmm. in Kansas City. Yeah. Being there for 13 years, like, how did that prepare you to be the GM of the Chicago Bears a day? Like, did you shadow people? Did you do internships? Did you shadow the GM? Were you the assistant GM? Like, how did you how did you get into that role versus what most players do? They just kind of get into coaching and then they might make that transition into being a GM. Yeah. You almost have to take one more step back Um, after I got cut from Chicago. You know, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I almost took a marketing job. Um, and then I got a call uh, from a friend at Boston College and said, hey, you want to come down and be a GA? So I said, I, I, yeah, absolutely. You know, because at that point, that's all you know is, is football and you mm-hmm. love it. You're passionate about it. So you jump in the recruiting part of it, which to me was by far the best thing I could have ever done. Really? So you're a recruiter at Boston? Yeah. OK. Yeah. And what you learn is is all the things in the office that you don't know when you're playing. So yeah. there's an example and I laugh about it all the time. A recruiting coordinator was like, all right, we got to put these packets together. So this is before the machines stapled the yeah. paper for you. So you had to staple them all. Well, I'm just coming in from from getting cut and I'm knocking them out, just getting it done as fast as I can. Staple, 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 staple. Put them all on, the, on my guy's desk, go work out. I come back and they're taped all over the office with a, a red circle around the staple. And it said WTF. And I'm like, what did I do wrong? So I'm looking at it. And he was like, these stables should be parallel at the top on every single one. It's a small job, but be detailed about it. Mm. So those little detail things from stapling to, you know, running, get coffee, watching tape, um, using the computer, like all of those little things, you start to kind of sharpen that blade early yeah. to know what office like is office life is all about. And then getting to Kansas City and really just starting at the bottom as a scouting assistant. And again, it's it's hard work. You know, no one really talks to you. You're grinding out tape for people. <laughs> no one's saying thank you. You know, it's it's tough. But through that, you get a rhythm of the league. Like mm-hmm. there used to be, now it's like electronic boards. Back then it was like magnets. Yeah. So you magnets, would have to yeah. do the Greens, magnets. Right. The blue. The and red. then on the board, you do the whole roster, or everyone's roster in the entire league. So 31 other teams. And through the season, you start moving the tags around. And then there's an IR bucket at the bottom. You see there's three or four teams that get the injury bug every single year because you're moving all these tags down. All right, how do they replace those players? They're going, there's trades. They're going to their emergency board. So you get the flow of the league mm-hmm. doing all these jobs that are hard work and, and no one's, you know, patting you on the back for, but you get a feel for what you're doing. And then through that, just getting time in college, scouting, going out on the road to pro scouting. Uh, getting a feel for the locker room. So those things kind of morph and just allow allowed me to create like all these little buckets. Mm-hmm. So then when it's time to go, there were for me, there were very few blind spots. Right. right. So right. that's been my path. I've been blessed too with the different jobs I've had to do, different types of GMs that I've worked for mm-hmm. that allowed me to do what I'm doing now. Ryan, that's I, I I love that story. And you drew a great picture. For for those that don't know, he's talking about the tags. Yeah. And so each player Whereas like blue is mean you're like top five. Yeah. Red is mean like you're a top tier Pro Bowl player. Mm-hmm. Green is your adequate starter. Yep. Then you had gray. You're like a uh, sub guy or whatever. Right. Special teams, whatever. Yep. I was a blue guy. You probably were a blue I was, guy. You were a blue guy too. We're I was guys. probably a red. No, mostly. you're blue. I'm going to give it to you. You're a blue guy. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate you're a blue it. guy. With gray hair. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, it's hilarious though to see like, mm-hmm. because your path and your journey, because I want to know, how do you go from being a former player to all of a sudden be an office in the office side and being a GM where you're the biggest guy 
in the office area because mm-hmm. most office guys are not big. Right. They're not former players like right. you. They half of these guys don't even have experience in football mm-hmm. on the field wise. Right. And to be in that moment to all of a sudden, I see how comfortable you are because you've done it all. Right. And so doing that and having that experience, maybe you could just tell us, you know, how you were so un- were you uncomfortable at first? Oh, yeah. Were you not confident? And playing football, does it actually help you at all? Yeah. So there's, I'll break that down into two things. Being uncomfortable, absolutely. Uh, because there's parts, I mean, you're writing reports, thousands of reports. And uh, my first GM that I worked for was Scott Pioli, getting a meeting, reading my report, my head's down, and uh, not really projecting. And after I get done with the report, it takes a, a little break. He says, hey, can I talk to you in my office? I'm like, oh, I'm about to get in trouble. <laughs> so he goes, listen, he goes, I swear to you, he said this. He's like, someday you're going to be a GM. He's like, there's something about you. He goes, but when you read your report, even if you have to stand up, stand up, project and talk with confidence so people believe in what what you're talking about and what right. your report says. Mm-hmm. So just those little things um, are huge, but they're uncomfortable at first. Because mm-hmm. you can talk ball, right? but can you write a report yeah. and do it the right way? Um, you're talking about grammar, all the, like, the little mm-hmm. things that you can right. get away from. Yes. Um, and then in terms of having the, the background, this is like this is real, especially in today's game. And I got a couple guys um, from Ian Cunningham, who's on my staff. He played Jeff Kings, one of our directors of player personnel. He played six, seven years as a tight end. The coolest thing is they always bring you back to just remembering what the locker room feels when you make certain moves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're always because even I'll I'll get away from it because it'll be more transactional. And one of my guys say, "Hold up, like." If we bring this guy into the building, into the locker room, how does that make everybody else feel? Yeah. yeah. If you take this guy out, what is that going to do to your culture? We how how are we going to replace talk about it? that? We don't think enough people realize that. Mm-hmm. No, not even it's, close. It's all about the locker room. Is this guy, we bring him in, he's got a lot of personality. Yeah. Is that going to make this guy feel uncomfortable? Yeah. Is he going to be a cancer to the team? Like, I don't think yeah. player, or excuse me. I don't think fans really get that because they'll be like, oh, you should just go get this player. He's like, uh, they it's, think of it like it's Matt. not, it's, it's not, not, Matt, it's not a good it's fit. It's not fantasy football. Yeah, like there's people it's like, it's not even, a good fit. I mean, we made some trades early and I, we made sure just from our conversations, Matt and I went and grabbed all the leaders and had a conversation said, this is why we're doing what we're doing. It's uncomfortable, mm-hmm. but we want to let you know how that is. I don't think people will talk about like DJ, DJ's moving out of one house into another in Carolina. He gets traded. Yeah. That's your life just got shaken up, right? And you got a kid, you got another kid on the way, you got, um, you know, your girl. Like, there's a lot that goes into it. So, from organization, we got to be there for him and, mm-hmm. and communicate properly and, and help him in that transition. So, having that, at least being in the locker room, I didn't play the level you guys did, but you got to have that feel of how all of these things affect your locker room. And it, to me, it goes a long ways and the guys appreciate that. So being a, so being the GM now and you kind of got your feet underneath you and you're, you're moving things along. Mm-hmm. Um, as a player, we all have that welcome to the NFL moment, like the first hit you took or something like that, that kind of really shook you as a GM. Mm-hmm. What was your welcome to the NFL moment? I am a GM. Holy, you know what that just happened. Like something like you didn't see, like something oh. that just like took, Took the wind out of you. Yeah, my uh, I, I've talked about this openly, so it's no secret. But the first free agent signing I had was a failed physical, and <laughs> I had this. I mean, it's got to. It was good money. Me. It was a player that was going to help us in our culture. It mm-hmm. was going to affect, you know, our defense. And to sit in a car and have that conversation, wanted to get ripped by his agent, but also to sit in a car and explain to him why I had to do what I had to do. Mm-hmm. Um, that crushed me yeah. because. I know that guy celebrated with his family. I know he flew up, ready to go, ready to do his press conference. And I got to, that's part of this thing that's hard as a yeah. GM too, is you can fill the locker room, yeah. but there is a business out of this thing where you got to do right by the business. And it wasn't right. And I had to, I had to make that call and that, that hurt me. Like that was, that was a tough, and that was a fir- one of the first big things I did when I walked in the door. Yeah. So uh, that was my welcome. <laughs> To the league moment as a general manager. Now, for sure. now Ryan, I got to know this because I've seen you the last couple of days with your family. Yeah. So clearly you're a family man. You yep. got your, your son, your daughter, your wife. You guys are all hanging out all the time. Yeah. Do they take a lot of pride? And how often do they, you see them celebrate? When you make this big trade to put to pull off the one that you did that everybody's talking about, trading yep. away, trading back down, mm-hmm. 
Do you guys like celebrate at the house? Are we doing like chest bumps? Like what's going on? Champagne yeah. pop. Like what's going on? What's up, man? Like, because I know, top, I know when you score the winning touchdown. Come on, son, up the, top. Hit me up the top. big game ah. and play. Like well, everybody's excited for you. Yeah. How is that? Could you wrap my head around that as the GM? Because now I got my suit and tie on. Yeah. Like they still celebrate the same? Uh, so I got a, so my wife was a former athlete, so it's on to the next thing. So there's, we celebrate, I mean, she's we're happy, hour. you she's, get a feel for her, but it's like, you got to go back to work. Like this is like, done. She's already yeah. on with Move it. Move on to the next one. <laughs> yeah. It's on to the next one. Right. Something about your wife, man, just keep you humble as Oh, so yeah. Just keep you real humble. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, good. You can't yeah. curse, man. It's Sorry. I apologize. Yeah, she, real we going to bleep that one out. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, she's, you know, she'll remind me this is free agency we got to win games like that's what it's about so that's true so does your son play football he does how, and how cool is it for your son to see you like yeah my dad is the gm does, does, yeah. and i know he's right there in the corner but like yeah. is it is it kind of cool it's like yo my dad is the gm of the bears yeah you know what i'm saying yeah. like how how cool is that experience for for your son to see you in the position that you're in right now yeah no i love it um you know i think the biggest thing for me though is just like the work ethic the time that it Mm -hmm. You got to put in, yeah. you know, he knows there's shoot four times, five times of the week, you know, I'm getting home and he's already sleeping. Um, so he gets how much time and effort that goes into this. Um, but also he knows, you know, the rewards that come with yeah. doing a good job and the cool thing about him. And he's, he's been on the Super Bowl parade. He knows what I'm trying to go for. Yeah. 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 Um, and he knows what it means to, to our family. So, so what advice would you give mm -hmm. to a player that has been released recently retired yep what advice would you give to that player who wants to go in the route that you went as far as not wanting to be a coach but yo i want to be a gm one day yeah. i want to run a team like i what, told my former gm this like what yeah. what so tell me yeah, yeah. what, what advice do you give yeah so i would say there's two routes to really dip your toe in and see if it's for you um to me it's an internship with one of the teams mm -hmm. or to be a ga at the college level Gotcha. Um, those two things for me and what I've seen to do for for folks that have come through both in Kansas City and our facility. Now you get an idea of what it's all about, the time that it takes, uh, what the lifestyle is like, because you don't really know until you, you can at least yeah. Yeah. dip your toe in a little bit. So that's my recomm recommendation um, is to do that and get started and, and see if you like it or not. But tell me this, is though, because yeah, I know we got to let you go. You're. We always ask this to everybody. Mm -hmm. Your Mount Rushmore of influence in your life. Yeah. Who would those four be? Yeah. So got to start out with my dad for sure. Why is um, that? My dad. Yeah. Uh, to me, I, I just been fortunate. I feel like I was raised the right way. Yeah. You know, the, the work ethic, mm -hmm. um, how I pri prioritize things in my life. Nice. Um, those are big and that's kind of my foundation. Nice. So it kind of starts there. But then in the game, you know, it's really the GMs and the head coaches that I work for. You know, Scott Pioli came in, really taught me about the discipline and and, and how to do things the right way. Um, John Dorsey allowed me to really get an eye as an evaluator, like how to evaluate, mm -hmm. how to build a roster, how to draft. Um, and then Brett Veach, who's in Kansas City, you know, his style too, always anticipating. Like your your brain's always got to be two steps ahead of everybody else, Playing chess. so that you Checkers, can, chess. yeah, so you can get the the pieces that you need. And then um, I would say Andy Reid would be on there too. Yeah, um, that's a guy who does it the right way, uh, has a great relationship with players, and it's that fine line being able to push your guys, but also show love and respect to them, so they're willing to do whatever you know for him. So I've always admired how he moves mm -hmm. and how he operates and how he leads. In the leadership piece is probably the one that sticks out too. It's like we went through some rocky things. There was losing streaks. There was winning streaks. Right. Um, this dude is just stable. Like he does not like. So you'll be walking down the hallway after a three game losing streak. You look at Andy and see what he's doing. Same thing. Just trying to find solutions and not yeah. talk about problems. And um, the way he moves to the organization and, and leads is incredible. That's awesome. Yeah. That's hey, awesome. Yep. Hey, appreciate you. Uh, Stopping by, Thanks coming through, me. being a guest on the show. Have Good fun. luck. Appreciate you. Thank Good you. luck, man. I'm rooting Thank for you. you guys. I'm, not, of course, always rooting for Chicago, but yeah. especially now uh, getting to know you and seeing yeah. your family. I know what you're about. Yep. Good luck, man. Do your thing. I'm Thank so you. proud of you. Appreciate it. Me too. I'm yep. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. I want that ring. Yes. Let's go.
I can't tell you how excited I am about the Chicago Bears and what Ryan Poles is doing. The buzz around town is he's making all the right moves. So, yeah, man, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the 2023 season of the Chicago Bears. Yeah, I, I totally understand why you're excited, but also understand and see why other people might not be as excited. Taking advantage, like taking, for instance, uh, Green Bay Packers mm-hmm. or these Minnesota Vikings. Uh, anybody that has to play the Bears might not be as excited just because you understand all the great things that Ryan Poles is doing there, the way he's trying to build this team from the ground up. And also, I really appreciate all the experiences that he shared with us personally about his journey from going back to college at right. BC to all of a sudden being at the lowest levels at Kansas City, moving up the moving up the food chain the way that he did. You truly understand why this man is successful and why he is a budding superstar in the category of GM in the right. NFL. Right. But more importantly, what we appreciate are you, the listeners. Thank you for tuning in to listening to myself and, and Roman Harper to the NFL Players Second Acts podcast. Keep listening.